so it's a great honor and pleasure for me to come here for Samson's birthday. I mean, we have been <coughs> friends for how many years? I don't even know. 28. 28, more than that, no? 29. Yeah. 29, maybe, okay. So I thought that it was a whole life anyway. So we have, we have discussed about many things. I have listened to him on physics many, many times without being sure of understanding what he was saying. But I mean, I certainly remember that when he talks to me, he says, you're the uh, unusual Frenchman. <laughs> <laughs> and I must say, I won't tell you what he refers to, but I'm very proud of this. OK, so uh, I will talk about focal Planck operators and the center of the enveloping algebras. So basically, I mean, I will explain certain things which are from physics point of view uh, rather down to earth, but maybe f with applications <coughs> to questions in mathematics uh, which are of some interest. So I will basically explain how classical objects like Laplacians can be deformed naturally to another category op of operators, which are in some sense operators well known in statistical physics, like Fokker Planck operators. And this deformation is legitimacy. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not for my own pleasure, but it was to uh, connect with uh, things uh, like Zellberg's uh, trace uh, formula by an interpolation process. So the interpolation process I refer to is interpolation between the Laplacian on one hand and a dynamical system like the geodesic floor on the other hand. And Zellberg's trace formula is exactly a sort of formula in which on one hand you have spectral data like Laplacians and on the other hand you have geodesics. And we will see how a certain understanding of this uh, formula will lead to explicit evaluations of objects which were not known before uh, but using instruments which are in some sense taken from physics. So uh, let me first of all start with extreme elementary question, uh, I mean considerations. So first of all uh, the Euler characteristic, so you take X to be a compact Riemannian manifold and you know that the Euler characteristic is a global invariant that the alternate sum of the dimensions of the cohomology groups of X. Now, if you take uh, a diffeomorphism of X, so it acts naturally on the cohomology. <coughs> so there is an action, linear action, and so you can find the Lefschet number, which is again a global invariant, which generalizes the other characteristic, and which is just the alternate sum of the traces of the, of the diffeomorphism group acting on the cohomology. Now, <coughs> there is a way to compute uh, explicitly uh, this uh, Lefschetz formula, <coughs> which is the so-called fixed point formula, or in the case of the identity chern gauss bonnet theorem, but which is always based on the fact, I mean, can be based on the fact that you can actually, to compute the cohomology, you can just use the Durham complex, whose cohomology is just the cohomology of X. And <coughs> if you introduce a Riemannian metric, you introduce the formal adjoint of the Durab operator and dx, which is d little dx plus little dx star, to be the corresponding drug operator. And it's square as a Hodge Laplacian. <coughs> so uh, basically, uh, the starting point of this uh, sort of, of, of computation is to say that you can re express Lefschetz number, which is a global, simple, in some sense, invariant in terms of supertraces of operators which are now calculated on an infinite dimensional object. <coughs> and that the supertrace of G exponential minus S times the Laplacian, and this formula is true for any S. So in some sense, if you just look at the right hand side, there are many eigenvalues, the contribution of zero eigenvalues, uh, of non-zero eigenvalues disappear, which explains uh, why the right hand side does not depend on S. <coughs> so that by making S tend to zero, uh, you obtain, I mean, you can obtain at least that's a way of proving the Lefschetz formula. The Lefschetz formula in terms of integral on fixed point set xg of the Euler form of Txg. So if the isolated point, if the points are isolated, you just get a sum of plus or minus one. So let me now move to the real subject of my talk. So I will consider now the heat operator on the manifold, on the Riemannian compact Riemannian manifold X. And I introduce again the Laplacian, delta x, and the corresponding heat kernel. So now g for t positive, it's a heat kernel at time t. t will be fixed. 
So this is an operator which acts on smooth functions on x with values in r. And so I will ask four uh, rhetorical questions. So the first question is, is the trace of the heat kernel a nulla characteristic? So can I think of this trace exactly in the way I was thinking of the trace of the diffeomorphism before? Can I view this as a sort of topological invariant? So is this a generalized nulla characteristic? So the second question I will ask is, Exactly as before, when I started from the cohomology and I replaced the cohomology by the Durham complex, can I replace the smooth functions by a much bigger space, <coughs> by a much bigger space R, such that I would write exactly a formula of the same type as before, re-expressing the trace of G in terms of a supertrace of G, but acting on a much bigger space, equipped with uh, with a generalized Dirac operator, which is exactly the analog of the operator dx, which I introduced before. And such that, in a certain way, I will, instead of getting, let's say, churn gauss bonnet or, or, or the fixed point formulas when making b tend to infinity, I would obtain something like Zellberg's trace formula, which is an extension of Poisson formula. So basically, the, the, the difference with what I did before is now our original space, which was the cohomology in the first, in the first example, is now the space of smooth functions. So uh, let me uh, just formalize the analogy again. <laughs> so in the case of Lefschetz number, I had L of G, which is Lefschetz number, generalized Euler characteristic. On the right hand side, I had a local formula for it, which is a fixed point formula, or churn gauss bonnet which is local. And to prove the formula, we use an interpolation involving the, the Durham complex. And basically, the interpolation just tells you that the left hand side is ultimately equal to the right hand side. So, this is exactly what we want to do. In some sense, I start from the trace of the heat kernel, which is a global which is a global object. And now, of course, I know more or less what I want to get on the right hand side, which is Zellberg's trace formula, but I want to find something in the middle which will do for us exactly what the Durham complex was doing before. So we are forced, in some sense, to consider the space of smooth functions and the manifold as the cohomology of something. The question is to know what is it the cohomology of. So before going on, but let me just remind you what Zellberg's trace formula is. And a concrete example, so this was the original formula proved by Zellberg. So if x is a Riemann surface of constant scalar curvature minus 2, uh, we introduce the closure to x and their lengths L gamma. <laughs> so Zellberg's trace formula in this case is an extension of Poisson formula. <laughs> so it expresses, it expresses on the left hand side the trace of the heat kernel. In terms of a bunch of terms, the first term is a complicated one with an integral of r <coughs> and with a volume factor in front of it, the volume of, of x, sorry, it's not sigma, is x. And then there are a number of terms <coughs> which are indexed by the closed judisics and with complicated factors. So you see exponential minus the length square, the usual thing. In the denominator, you have two hyperbolic sine of length square over two and then you have this infinite sum. So, in some sense, what I will show is exactly finding what is a proper analytic and geometric structure which will interpolate between the two sides. So, uh, let me now move to the context on which I will effectively develop this theory. So, this will be uh, the context of the symmetric spaces. So I introduce uh, uh, G to be a, a real reductive group. So if you don't know what reductive groups are, just think of SL2R if you wish. And K a maximal compact subgroup, which is the case of SL2R is S1. And X equal G mod K is the corresponding symmetric space. So I also introduce the uh, Cartan splitting of the Lie algebra of the group. <laughs> So, so, so typically the Lie algebra splits into two pieces, P and K. There is a natural quadratic form of the Lie algebra, which is positive on P and negative on K. That's an orthogonal splitting. 
And so this uh, splitting of Lie algebras descends to a bundle of Lie algebras on the symmetric space, uh, Tx plus n, modeled on the splitting g equal p plus k. So again, the basic example is g equal SL to R, k is just a matrix, orthogonal matrix, two by two matrix, x is just a complex upper half plane, and Tx plus n, there is this n, is a bundle of dimension 3 over x. So the analysis that we shall do will be done on the product of the group by its Lie algebra and quotient by k. So uh, quotient by k, k acts on the group on the right, it acts on the Lie algebra on the left, and there is a standard procedure to do the quotient. So the, co the analysis will be done on this, and this object is itself a geometric object. So it is at the same time a group theoretic object, but that's also a geometric object that the total space x, x plus or hex hat of tx plus n over x equal g mod k. So you have this, if you like, the upper half plane, you have this three dimensional bundle. And so in the case of SL2, you will do the analysis, I mean, differential operators, will occur on a space of total dimension 2 plus 3, which is 5. So, so, sorry. Yes? Uh, how is it? The, the total bundle is, is trivial, right? The total bundle is trivial, yes. I mean, the fact the bundle is trivial doesn't mean that the theory I will, I mean, it doesn't imply, at least directly, that the theory I will develop is trivial. Because the, no, no but I mean, I want to make the point that there will be a non-trivial coupling between the base and the fiber. Okay, so we will do two separate constructions, first of all on the group and on the other side, on the other hand, on the Lie algebra. So for the moment we forget about the quotient and I will explain the two constructions on one hand on the group and on the other side on the Lie algebra. So on the group side, Casimir and Kostad. So if you have a reductive group, like on a compactly group, <coughs> you have, uh, I mean, you have the, 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 the extension of the of the, of the Laplacian, or minus the Laplacian, I would say, I make it with a minus sign, which is the Casimir operator. So that's an invariant differential operator on the group that takes into account the fact that there is this killing form which is positive in one direction, negative on the other direction. So that's why Cg equal minus sum of E star i Ei, it takes into account the positivity or negativity of the form, of the killing form B on the, on the Lie algebra. So if you like, that's an extension of Laplacian, but that's a good Laplacian in the P direction and a bad Laplacian with the wrong side in the K direction. So that's quadratic why... Casimir. There are many Casimir. This is quadratic. quadratic. This is a quadratic Casimir. Yes, yes. I will talk, ab after all, about all the possible oh. Casimirs. Yes, no, I mean, that will be the end of the talk. Okay, so I introduce also the Clifford algebra of G equipped with an with a invariant form minus B. And this Clifford algebra acts on the exterior algebra of G star. So basically Costant introduced an operator which, whose square essentially is the, is, is the Casimir. Okay, so to do this, uh, I just introduced now the enveloping algebra U of G, that the algebra of left invariant differential operators on the group. So if you take the Lie algebra, it defines invariant uh, vector fields and you look at the algebra of differential operators generated by these vector fields at U of G. And so the Dirac operator is a first order differential operator on the group and it can be described as a section of the Clifford algebra tensed by, the, the, by U of G, is actually a differential operator of order one, <laughs> of order one, and it, it has uh, first piece uh, which looks like a Dirac operator, the sum of C hat of EI star EI, that's in some sense the classical Dirac operator, and there, there is a correction which is a cubic correction of length three in the Clifford algebra, and which involves uh, the fundamental three form, three form, anti-symmetric three form on the Lie algebra, which is given by B of, of U bracket V W, that's an anti-symmetric three form, and so that's the way that Costant constructed his Dirac operator. And so the formula of Costant, uh, I remember that, uh, that, uh, that I was told by you that it was already 
proved by physicists before, but that the square of the Dirac operator of co-start is essentially up to a constant given by minus a Casimir. So this co-start operator, I mean, doesn't act on smooth functions. While the Casimir act on smooth, on smooth real functions, <laughs> the Casimir acts on, uh, on, on smooth functions on the group with values in the exterior algebra of G star because of the Clifford algebra, while CG itself can be made to act on the smooth functions. So this is such an identity we will use uh, partly from an analytic point of view, that is, effectively try to reveal the hidden exterior algebra of G star. Now, let me explain what we shall do on the Lie algebra side. I told you the analysis is done on two pieces, the group on one hand, the Lie algebra, and then we will couple them. So on the Lie algebra, G, first of all, we will make a, a weak rotation on the Lie algebra. Okay, the Lie algebra G, as I told you, is not an Euclidean vector space, it's a Lorentzian-like vector space. So we make a weak rotation to transform it into an Euclidean vector space. So we replace P plus K by P plus IK. And uh, I introduce the harmonic oscillator on this GI. So, as you know, the harmonic oscillator is given by this formula here, where Y is the generic is a generic point in GI, and we will, in some sense also on this GI, introduce a Dirac operator, <coughs> a Dirac operator, <coughs> which is a Witten operator. I mean, that's, uh, that's connected with the uh, Witten's idea of the twisting of the Dirac operator on a Euclidean vector space. So uh, we twist uh, this on this Euclidean vector space, the Dirac operator, <coughs> by the Gaussian, by the Gaussian function, so we get two new operators, the, Durham, the modified Durham, which is D plus Y wedge, and the other one, which is its formula joint. And these two operators also act now on smooth forms on, the Lee, on, on, on G with coefficients in the exterior algebra. And so this operator here is a Dirac-like operator acting on GI, the sum of these two, and the corresponding <laughs> Laplacian, that was a formula originally obtained by, by Witten, tells you that up to a factor, <laughs> this Laplacian is given by the harmonic oscillator, which is a sort of bosonic number operator, plus the fermionic number operator acting on the Lie algebra. So we're going to couple these two constructions. On one hand, the constant operator acting on the group, and on the other hand, the Witten-like operator acting on the Lie algebra. So I will to construct now a new uh, Dirac operator DB, uh, parameterized by B positive. So this operator DB will be a combination of the Dirac operators on the group and on the Lie algebra. So what does this mean? This means that this new operator DB will act on smooth functions on the group times the Lie algebra with coefficients in the exterior algebra of G star. So remember, I told you that the constant operator was acting on functions on the group with values in the exterior algebra. The Witten operator acts on functions on the Lie algebra with values in the same Lie algebra up to complexification. So we can effectively combine the two. So let me just give the formula. So you see, forget about the red factor. So the first term in this DB, that's a new Dirac operator acting on a big space, the first term is a constant Dirac operator, and the second one is just a scale version of the Witten-like Dirac operator, and there is a third mysterious term, which is in red, which is non-linear, which is quadratic, and whose, I mean, whose presence plays an essential role, because if it was not there, I would not be there either. And, I mean, it's introduced, it has to be forced because we will do the quotienting by k. Remember that ultimately we will descend everything to the quotient by k. So that's this operator db. So db is a k-invariant operator. It's so not... Uh, yes? And these y's now correspond to the points in both directions separately or...? Sorry, sorry? These y's... Excuse me? These y's correspond to points in the... In yes, yes, yes. Direction. Yes, yes, yes. 
Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. So in, in the GI direction, you have two components, YP and YK, and that, that's why you take, you take the leg bracket. Okay, so, so that's exactly this. So the, the introduction of the quadratic term, I won't have time to explain much about this, is related. You have to introduce this because you will eventually caution things by K, which introduces nonlinearities by itself. So what is this object that I will call the hypoelliptic Laplacian? I will explain later what is hypoelliptic. So it is just the operator LB, you, which is one half of db square minus d hat, d hat k square. So remember, up to the quadratic factor I won't mention, db is just a sum of the Dirac constant operator on G plus the written operator on the Lie algebra. You take the square of the sum and you subtract in some sense the square of the first term. So you undo what you had done, except that you have less to it when you have a plus b squared, that a squared plus a b plus b a plus b squared. So you subtract a squared. And you ultimately caution the construction by k, because all these objects are k invariant. They're not g invariant, they are k invariant. So as I mentioned before, the Lie algebra descends to a vector bundle Tx plus n, which is sort of canonically trivial, but not trivial as an Euclidean vector bundle. So let me introduce again the space x hat, that's a bundle over x, over the symmetric space, whose fibers are Tx plus n. And so our operator LBX, I explained before, it will act on smooth sections over x script of the pullback of the exterior algebra of t star x plus n star. So in other words, g star is now replaced by t star x plus n star. So using the uh, Bargman isomorphism, I could put things in a more symmetric way. Instead of viewing things as a geometric object acting on this bigger space, you could say, I don't make the space bigger, I just keep the space x down here, but the price to pay is that you will act on an infinite dimensional vector bundle involving the symmetric algebra, which appeared also in Ann Taumina's talk this morning. So it's the, same, it's the same object, except I just have one copy instead of having an infinite number of copies. So let me give you, first of all, a formula for this operator LBX. So this operator LBX is supposed to be a deformation of the original scalar Laplacian. Okay, so this operator LBX, if you just look at the red pieces, it's essentially a Fokker Planck operator. So in other words, this operator LBX, it's harmonic oscillator in the fibers of Tx plus n, which I view as an Euclidean vector bundle after weak rotation. There is this harmonic oscillator in red, and there is this piece here, which is what I call the geodesic floor. Well, if there was only Tx, if there was only Tx, you have a Riemannian manifold x, you have, the, you have the fiber Tx, and on this big object of dimension twice the original dimension, you have the geodesic floor, and that's what's represented by the nabla y Tx. So if we forget about the other geometric terms, we just have essentially a Fokker Planck operator, which is a coupling of this harmonic oscillator in the fiber and the geodesic flow in some sense, which is a vector field on the base. So this operator is non-self-adjoint. I mean, it is non-self-adjoint, obviously not. The geodesic flow is anti-symmetric. It is, it is not elliptic. Elliptic means that there is, I mean, it just differentiates once in the base direction, not twice. So it doesn't, it's not a Laplacian in the usual sense. But what I'm saying is that from an analytic point of view, it's a very good operator. It's almost as good as uh, the Laplacian. It's why it's called hypoelliptic. And what I'm saying besides is that this operator deforms naturally uh, the original Laplacian. So this actually you can prove in a rigorous mathematical way this operator LBX deforms in some sense the original Casimir operator 
or Laplacian, if you like, acting on the base x. So that means that when b tends to 0, there is a collapsing of the space x script to the space x. So let's try to understand a little bit this collapsing. I mean, what happens is that when b tends to 0, <laughs> the harmonic oscillator gets scaled by a big factor, and that in some sense, <laughs> uh, when b tends to 0, you ignore everything of the eigen, eigen spaces or eigenvalues of this operator except the zero eigenvalue. That's exactly a collapsing phenomenon, which is in some sense exactly the same sort of collapsing that you have when you have look at kaluza klein theory, in which a very small circle, the circle gets smaller and smaller, <coughs> because, I mean, in some sense you just concentrate on the fundamental, on the ground state of the circle. You have exactly the same phenomenon here. You concentrate on the ground state of the harmonic oscillator, except that there is here a non-trivial coupling between the fiber and the base via the geodesic floor, which ultimately explains, I won't prove that, that in the proper sense, the operator LBX deforms. Actually, when B tends to zero, there is a language, there is a theory in which you can say this is transport Fokker Planck operator deforms the original Laplacian. But it is not only that it deforms it, because it still captures a lot of information on the original Laplacian, in particular on its spectrum, as long as it will work with compact quotients. So uh, as b tends to infinity, after rescaling, you see that it is the geodesic floor which dominates. <laughs> so when b tends to zero, you deform to the Laplacian. When b tends to infinity, the geodesic floor dominates. And if you think of taking traces of heat kernels, you can see why when b tends to infinity you will ultimately select closed physics. So let me apply this to locally symmetric spaces now. So original symmetric space x is just Rn, as a, as a smooth space is just Rn. So we need to build first of all a compact manifold from this space. So basically what you do is that you take a discrete subgroup of the group G and gamma, and I will assume that it is co-compact and torsion-free, so this is just complicated language to say that gamma acts freely on the, on, in a discrete way on X, <laughs> so you can form the compact quotient gamma on X, that's a compact manifold, exactly <coughs> like S1 is a quotient of R <coughs> by the action of Z, and so I will give my first identity the first identity says that the trace on the smooth functions on Z, forget about this E, just take E equals R for the moment, on smooth functions of the heat kernel, is equal to the supertrace of the hypolypt heat kernel. So we have exactly an identity which is similar to what I wanted to have before, to deform the evaluation of the heat kernel into something more complicated involving more coordinates and actually if we think of it <laughs> this idea of resolving of replacing this of saying the space of smooth functions is the cohomology of something is actually embedded in the construction I gave before through this written harmonic oscillator I won't give details on that but we have exactly what we want and what is small c sorry what is small c Oh, C is just the B squared, I mean, the, the, the defect in, 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 in Coston's formula. That's uh, just a defect in Coston's formula, that the lengths of rho g, that's a square. Mm -hmm. Excuse me? About a question about this, this theorem? Yes. So, uh, isn't that like uh, the... In physics you would say that you have the supersymmetric as yes. L2 sigma model, and this is just localization? Yes, so this is exactly, so we have, I mean, in some sense, we have constructed a supersymmetry in a theory which is not supersymmetric, so that was... Yeah, that's your Lie algebra. The Lie algebra is where the fermions are, and this is just localization, the standard. I mean, localization is still not done. I mean, you, you, you just, we will localize later well, on. Okay, we'll take B, we'll take B, 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 B to infinity, infinity, and then we will... Infinity, and then you get geodesics. Yes, yes, that's, so th this is what we will do, but... Okay. Sorry? Wasn't that done in the physics literature long ago? No, I don't think so. <laughs> no, not for that. No, 
No, because I mean the idea that Fokker-Planck operators deform the Laplacian. You, you see, what this contains in particular is that the spectrum of the Laplacian is contained in the spectrum of these Fokker-Planck operators. Okay, these Fokker-Planck operators have some real eigenvalues, they have non-real eigenvalues, so ultimately when taking the supertrace, the non-real eigenvalues disappear, and what's left is just the real eigenvalues. So you have had more eigenvalues, but no. Okay, so let me now say that there is a supersymmetric uh, interpretation involving, in, involving the, complication, the complexification of the group, but I won't mention it here. So splitting the identity. So each side, I mean, since you're on a compact, on a copent quotient by a discrete group, each side splits as an infinite sum indexed by the conjugacy classes and gamma. <laughs> so uh, this, I mean, exactly like Poisson original formula says that your heat kernel on S1 is just a sum over a Z, you can exactly do the same thing. And now, <laughs> The miracle is that this identity splits as an identity. That is, you can forget about the group gamma, and you can say the identity remains true in some sense, element of gamma by element of gamma. It is not an identity of sums. The identity remains true, and that's an identity of objects which are called orbital integrals. So let me briefly mention what semi-simple orbital integrals are. Orbital integrals are fundamental in, 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 in the theory of representation, automorphic forms and so on. So let me just take the simplest case. Actually, I take a semi-simple element gamma and I call bracket gamma its conjugacy class. So basically, uh, an orbital integral, that's its name, <laughs> is that you integrate uh, the heat kernel on X I mean, you need to introduce some notation for that, <laughs> on the orbit, on the adjoint orbit of gamma by the action of G on the element gamma. And the integral is an integral of the quotient of Z quotient by Z of gamma. <laughs> so <laughs> these are the objects which are the ingredients which appear when you express the trace of the compact quotient in terms of the group gamma. In some sense, you re-express this trace as object, which are the orbital integrals. So let me give a geometric description, brief geometric description of what the orbitals integral are. <laughs> so I will just introduce this picture. So <laughs> this, this is a flat space which is supposed to represent the symmetric space. X equals Rn, if you like. So inside this Rn, or inside the symmetric space, there is a submanifold, which is X of gamma, <coughs> which is uh, also a symmetric space. And it can be geometrically constructed by minimizing, <coughs> by minimizing the so-called displacement function d gamma of X, which is d of X and gamma X, where d is a Riemannian distance. Now, the Riemannian distance on such symmetric spaces are, is convex in the sense that it is convex on geodesics. So the minimizing set is non-empty because gamma is semi-simple and it is convex. It's X of gamma. This X of gamma is actually a symmetric space for the centralizer of gamma. So how can you understand what the orbital integral is? I just describe it geometrically. What you do is that you take the heat kernel, <coughs> you take the heat kernel, you take a normal, you take a x0 in x of gamma, you take a normal, <coughs> and you take a generic point y. You look at its image by gamma, gamma is an isometry, it maps normal geodesic to a normal geodesic, <coughs> and you find that because of negative curvature, <coughs> the mutual distance of y and gamma y grows at least linearly when y <coughs> tends to infinity. And you use the ultimately the fact that the heat kernel <coughs> decays at long distances like a Gaussian on the symmetric space so that the above integral exists. So in other words, you take the heat kernel at y and gamma y and you integrate it in normal directions, you ultimately get a Gaussian integral which converges. That's the orbital integral. <coughs> so the point of the hypoleptic theory 
will be to push, ultimately what we will do is push the integral to x of gamma to the close of this x. So the second fundamental identity is that effectively, instead of having an identity of traces, you get an identity of the so-called orbital integrals, which are now calculated using heat kernels over the symmetric space, not over the compact quotient. This is true for any b. So let me now take the limit as b tends to infinity. So after rescaling this operator Lb, the original operator we had when b tends to infinity, is dominated in a way by the geodesic flaw, except that there is this extremely large term, quartic term, which dominates everything, which means that localization will take place on commuting pairs, yn and ytx. And so, ultimately, the computation of the orbital integral localizes near the manifold of geodesics, this x of gamma, associated with gamma. As I explained before, the point of this is to push the integral to x of gamma. So, let me try to explain what is the structure of the formula for these orbital integrals. So, I take a gamma to be a semi-simple element, which means that it is in a certain way diagonalizable. So, I take its, its reduced form, I write it as a product of a self-adjoint, if you like, a unitary element e to the a times k minus 1, where a is in p and k is in k. So after conjugation you can always do that, and these pairs are commuting. So let me uh, call z of gamma to be the centralizer of gamma, and whose Lie algebra splits again as p and gamma plus k of gamma. So z of gamma is still a, is still a semi-simple, is still a reductive group. Sorry, uh, yes. Ju just on precision in the previous slide. Yes. Uh, so I think it's related to the previous Zopic question. When you take the b to infinity, and yes, this corresponds to the closure of the flows, right? Yes. Of the geodesics. Yes. So the, it essentially, it constitutes localization. But uh, your 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 result comes from the de deformed uh, uh, L, right? Yes. So essentially, this is not this is deformed factor plan plus your. Uh, so so the localization will come from this deformed Fokker plan. Because you're taking the trace. Yeah, but this result is not from the like conventional Fokker plug. This is already a deformed one. Because your LB is defined as a cost on squared, uh, minus cost on squared. Yes, but I told you the original result tells you that the original object you went to compute is equal to the deformed one. Okay, this was the first thing. The original object you went to compute is equal to the deformed one. So if you localize a deformed one, you get something which is equal to the original object. Okay, so you started from the Casimir. Yeah. You deform it to this Fokker Planck like operator, mm -hmm. but still you preserve the original object. Mm -hmm. Which right. means if you were working on the but compact quotient. The difference is that it, it exactly reproduces in this limit the same, yeah. the, the same contribution. Sorry? How, yeah, so essentially, you're saying that the, in, in this limit uh, it reproduces an uh, original result. It are, yes. Yes. So it means like your deformation and this limit. Yes, there is a deformation, but you do not change anything. Okay. And, 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 and now, of course, the result I have is no longer a spectral result. Okay. It's no longer. The point is of this thing is if you can analyze now things judicic, if you like, close judicic by close judicic, instead of having to localize an infinite number of judicic at the same time. Exactly. Okay. Can you make a comment about yes. the, the relationship to the physics? Yes. Because there is this uh, paper on localization that you do the number <coughs> formula by. Kaki or Kaki? I don't yes. know how to pronounce it. Yes. So, what's the relation to what you are doing? I, I, I don't know the paper that you're mentioning. Okay, maybe we'll talk about this later. Okay, so let me give the evaluation of the semi simple orbital integrals. And this formula will extend the formula of Zellberg I gave at the beginning. So, there is an explicit function j gamma, which is a function on i k of gamma. So, let's fix the notation again. You have gamma, semi simple element. You have its Lie algebra, z of gamma, which splits into p and k of gamma. And so this function here is defined on i k of gamma, on the weak rotated i k of gamma, <coughs> such that the original object, the original object, which is a trace gamma, okay, the orbital integral associated with the elliptic heat kernel. And now let's look at the formula. The formula should be looked at as an Atiyah-Singer-like of index theorem 
in which integration on the manifold is replaced by integration on i k of gamma. <laughs> you have the first term, which is j of gamma, which will be an analog of the Todd or A roof genus, but now it's a function. Now I have a churn character like if I did not introduce a twisting bundle, so if you like you can ignore it. If you're interested in sections of vector bundles, you have to introduce it. And you have a Gaussian integral here. And so really the mystery lies in this function j of gamma. So I told you it's a function, it's not a characteristic class, it's a function. And so this function j of gamma, it looks intimidating, but in some sense it's a supersymmetric version of the A roof genus. <laughs> On this manifold x, you had these two bundles Tx plus n. But actually, from the point of view of this point of view, you have to look at this as Tx minus n. <laughs> so the contribution will be the ratio of the corresponding A roof gene genera or A roof functions. So I give the function here, I give the formula, which is every time <laughs> a ratio of functions <laughs> evaluated on the p and the k part. The p part always appears in numerator, <laughs> the k part in denominator, and these functions take into account a fine splitting of the Lie algebra under the action, under the adjoint action of the representation of k of gamma. <laughs> the, the detail for the moment is not important here. So the center of the enveloping algebra. So again, let me remind you that u of g is the enveloping algebra, that's a non-commutative algebra, and inside there is a center which is a commutative algebra. So I will introduce S of G, which is the algebra of polynomials on G star, and I of G, which are the invariant polynomials on G star. So the group, the group there is an action, let's say, of the, of the group or of the Lie algebra on these polynomials and look at these invariants. So the Duflo isomorphism <laughs> tells you that these two algebras are properly isomorphic. <laughs> so the isomorphism is, is non-trivial, you cannot guess what it is just by looking at these two algebras, but it tells you that there is a canonical isomorphism of these two algebras. So the center of the Lie algebra is indeed an algebra of polynomials on G star. So in particular, for instance, uh, when you want to look at what corresponds to the Casimir, see G in this algebra I of G, that's minus B star plus B star of rho G rho G, B star being the dual of B. That is, it's a polynomial of degree 2 on G star. So center and enveloping algebras. So and I take L to be an element of the center, Z of G, and I take its counterpart in the algebra of polynomials, I of G. So what I'm saying is that this element 2D minus 1 of E, this polynomial, restricts to an element of I of Z of gamma. So the restriction is not entirely, is not entirely natural, but there is a natural projection from the Lie algebra on Z of gamma, so that you can define in some sense, the proper sense, <laughs> the restriction of this element. So from a polynomial, you get a polynomial on the Lie algebra of the center. And again, from this polynomial now, you rebuild a differential operator. You rebuild a differential operator on Z of gamma with constant coefficients. So in other words, you take the element of the center, you look at the corresponding polynomial, you restrict it to Z of gamma and you rebuild a differential operator acting on Z of gamma with constant coefficients. I would say even acting on the complexification of Z of gamma. Sorry? Excuse me? The center? Yes, Z of gamma is just a Lie algebra Z of, of the centralizer of gamma. Yeah, the Lie algebra, okay. So the formula for general orbital integrals, now instead of uh, writing it for the heat kernel, I take, any <coughs> I take any kernel in some sense of a Casimir, 
<laughs> so this is a formula that I proved with Shushen in 2019, <laughs> which says that the orbital integral of L, so in other words, a new ingredient now is this L, this element of the center, which actually probably involves all the possible Casimirs that you were mentioning, <laughs> times a kernel, an arbitrary kernel of the, <laughs> of the Casimir. <laughs> well, I mean, it's given by uh, the action of a new kernel. You take a new kernel, which now acts on the Lie algebra on i times k of gamma. Okay, you, you, so you need to introduce, to, to understand this, this formula, it is not too complicated. You, you have the action on the right-hand side of the differential operator L z of gamma, which acts on z of gamma, and you compose it with a kernel of a corresponding Laplacian on z of gamma, and you make it act on this distribution, j gamma times, in the case we introduce a twisting bundle, the corresponding character for the twisting bundle. We evaluate this kernel at zero, so in other words, you make it act on this distribution, you have a smooth kernel, you make it act on the distribution, you evaluate it at zero, and the formula is that the original orbital integral is equal to this new evaluation of smooth kernels <laughs> on the Lie algebra of z of gamma. Okay, so for L equals 1, <laughs> that's essentially the original formula. <laughs> so the principle of the proof, we start from the formula for with L equals 1. <laughs> so when gamma is regular, that is when it's regular, that is if you like when all its eigenvalues are distinct, <laughs> so it centralizes a Cartan subgroup, <laughs> the formula I gave before for the heat kernel simplifies dramatically and can be differentiated in gamma. And then ultimately we use uh, fundamental results of Arish Chandra to evaluate the action of a differential operator on our original formula, the formula without the L, to obtain a formula for L for gamma regular. And so if gamma is semi-simple and arbitrary, we use a previous result for gamma regular and limit results of Arish Chandra <laughs> to obtain the general formula. So let me just remind you what the function j gamma is. So that for general semi-simple element gamma, that sort of quotients of determinants evaluating the p and k part of the Lie algebra of z of gamma. Now it turns out that when gamma is regular, there are sort of cancellations, I would say supersymmetric cancellations, between the contributions of p and the contributions of k, so that the formula simplifies dramatically. So, more precisely, you can re-express the function of j of gamma in terms of the roots, of root system, but essentially of the purely imaginary roots of the reductive group. So, the imaginary roots are the ones which just correspond to the action of k, of, on the p and k part. So, uh, that means that there is exactly as before where the eigenvalues were disappearing, here it's the p and k factors which cancel each other. <laughs> and so this allows us to, to treat in some sense, the, to prove that this function in the proper sense is smooth as a function of gamma, as long as gamma is, is, is regular, that is it's, if its eigenvalues, if you like, are distinct. So, I will complete this by reminding you something that you all know, that's a Langevin equation, <laughs> that in 1908 uh, Langevin introduced a Langevin equation, mx double dot equal minus x dot plus u double u dot, to reconcile Brownian motion and <laughs> classical mechanics. So, Brownian motion for m equals zero and classical mechanics for m equals infinity. <laughs> so, in this theory of the interpolating <laughs> Hyperelliptic Laplacian m equals b square plays the role of a mass. So this hyperelliptic interpolation plays exactly, in some sense, uses the tools or the objects introduced by Langevin at the time, of course, with no group theoretic I mean, interpretation. So here is, the interpre is, a, is a paper by, by Langevin in 1908 where you find exactly the equation written as I wrote it before and with an interpretation that you all know. Okay, I think I will just give the references here. 
and uh, happy birthday, Samson. Thank you very much. Questions? Yes? Please. Yeah, I always have that naive question about the Costans Dirac. Yes. So, like, uh, if you took some other Dirac on the group, what, what would go wrong or what would go right? I mean, you see, uh, there is the, the, the key thing which I've not explained is that the Casimir lies in the center. Okay, so in the equality of the trace is equal to the super trace, the fact that it lies in the center plays a fundamental role because basically you need to prove that, you know, to write the super trace of some super commutator vanishes and the fact that the bad term disappears is related to the fact it is a Casimir. Mm -hmm. So there is only one operator which will do what you want. All the other ones will always contain something which makes them outside of the center. Is that some more complicated whatever book? Yes. Yes, yes. So that's why you need absolutely the co-stop. Okay, so that's... Mm -hmm. I did not explain this, but the Casimir is in the center. I mean, and that plays a fundamental role in the fact that deformation is... Uh, yes? Two questions. Could you give an example of something that, you know, uh, a, ph a old physicist like myself can understand that you can do with these wonderful formulas? Yes. The application. That's question one. Question two is, if you think of G as being, for example, the, the group of gauge transformations, yes. Yes. can you use this and tie it uh, in with, say, DRST or so? Or? Yes, okay, so, so let me try to, to, an to answer to this. Okay, so first of all about the role of the geodesic flow. Why is your geodesic flow there? And then I will give an explanation, I think, which is, okay, if you think of the geodesic flow and you think you write it in coordinates, y, d over dx, if you take its symbol, that is, you make a Fourier transform in the x variable, what you get is square root of minus 1, y, xi. If you exponentiate this, you see that this is Fourier transform. Okay, so the ultimate reason why the geodesic flow appears, it's because, in some sense, it does, for us mathematicians, what it does is a Fourier transform. Okay, so we are geometrically trying to implement the idea of the Fourier transform in a context, of course, if you think of Fokker-Planck operators, I think it's fair to say nobody thinks of Fokker-Planck operator of doing Fourier transform of anything. Okay, it is a dynamical, statistical physics system that you try to describe. But the way we use it is this idea of Fourier transform. The second thing is that in the case where the face is flat, that is where you work in the case of R or S1, everything can be, can be worked out explicitly in some sense. It is not so simple, even that case, to understand mathematically what, what happens. So let me try to say it in words. So, you have the question that you know that you can quantize uh, the group of symplectomorphisms. We can quantize, there is a quantization to operators. You pass from symplectomorphism to unitary operators. Okay, let me say roughly. What happens in this theory is that what you're quantizing is not symplectomorphism real ones, you're quantizing complex ones. Okay. So the quantization of complex symplectomorphism introduces a phase. I mean, if you look at the, the corresponding operator which appears on the other side, it will no longer be unitary. But the worst is that it will be badly unbounded. Okay. However, if the consequences of this theory are true, that would mean that two operators which look very different are ultimately the same because they are conjugate by something. Okay, this something does not exist because it doesn't act, but still the operators behave, they behave properly. That is, they still have the same spectrum. Okay, so if you were doing this forgetting about, about this, you would just remain in the realm of classical Schrodinger-like operators. If you just quantize these non-complex transformations, 
you pass to a completely different category of operators. Yeah, so I think that's the best explanation I can give for the moment. Other questions? Maybe it's not a short question. Can I put instead of functions representations? Yes, yes, yes. You can put representations, and that's why you have this extra contribution of pairing of the A roof function, I mean, with a churn character function, which in this case is just a character corresponding to these representations. Yes, so that's why it was there. Yes. Other questions? If not, well, thanks again. Okay, thank you.